Hey guys, welcome to the Soccer Queens podcast. Today is such a great episode ahead because this is actually the first uh, physical therapist I've had on here, which is crazy because we're on like episode 40 or something. So I'm really excited to have my friend Andy here with me to talk about the rehab side of soccer training and how to keep players healthy as well as make sure they're returning back to the field healthier than they were before prior to injury. So Andy, welcome to the show. If you could just give a background on who you are and all the things you're up to today. Yeah. So, hey guys, thanks for listening. My name is Andy Serafin. I am a physical therapist and fitness coach for soccer players. Um, so yeah, I grew up in New Jersey, born and bred and raised. That's where my heart is, along with all the food I love to eat is where it's based out of. Um, and I grew up playing soccer at a recreational level and I went to Temple University, studied kinesiology slash exercise science. I went to Duke for physical therapy school. And, um, next week I start a sports physical therapy residency program with Orlando Health, where I'll be working with athletes from the um, Orlando City Soccer Club, as well as UCF. And yeah, really excited to get into another year of learning and applying what I know to serving athletes. That's awesome. And yeah, we are fellow Florida residents for now. Um, I selfishly want Andy to stay here uh, after his year at Orlando Health, but um, we'll have to connect soon before you leave. I'm sure we'll have plenty of time. <laughs> Now, I'm always interested uh, with physical therapists and why they get into the field. And was there uh, any moment or like injury you had where you're like, oh, I need to like serve others and this is my purpose or was it something else? Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because a lot of PTs and a lot of PT students, when they're applying to PT school and writing their application essays, they kind of have an injury of like, oh, I was a high level athlete. I tore my ACL, then I went to PT, and I really liked it, so I decided to pursue it as a profession. But for me, that really wasn't the case. Um, I was never a high-level athlete, actually, and because of that, I never really got injured as a kid. Um, but I was always interested in healthcare, and um, both my parents are in healthcare, and that's something that I really wanted to get into because I find that field very fulfilling. Um, and I was kind of going through the, the different options of medicine, PT, OT, um, nursing, PA, podiatry. And one of the things that I really found the most impactful for me is spending time with my patients and the ability to sit down with somebody for 45 minutes, once, twice, sometimes three times a week is, is really empowering for me because you get to know them on a very personal level. And that's something that I really, really value in my practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're also seeing them go through a lot of hardship, um, especially with some of your, your longer rehab, like ACL or hamstring. You see them going through a lot physically, but, but also mentally. And I, I know we wanted to dive into return to play. And there, there's a lot of listeners who are always asking about ACL rehab. And there's so many different PTs out there who approach it differently uh, as far as return to play. But like, what are some of your, your staples before sending a player back to the field? And what are you working towards? Number one is having the body be ready, right? Having the right strength and the right power development and the right agility, all of that is very, very important. Um, and I consider that the body side and the other side, which I'm sure you're very much in tune with is the mental side, because you can be as ready as you can physically, but if you feel like for whatever reason, mentally or, or through a confidence perspective, you're not there, then that's a huge issue because that will interrupt the, the body, the body and the mind, they have to work together. Um, so you, you do your physical assessments as a PT or as a strength coach and you say, okay, objectively, this is what I need to improve. And then I like to go ahead and ask the athlete, like, hey, how'd you feel? Like on a scale of one to 10, how confident did you feel? Or if you had to play in a game today, what are some things you feel really good about? And what are the things you feel not so good about? And then go ahead and address those with the athlete. That way they're preparing their body and they know that confidence wise, they're getting back to the right space. Mm -hmm. Now, are you doing a lot of 
uh, like contact drills, the closer they get to returning back to the field for that first game back. Yeah, if we can, I would love to, um, depending on where I am working or where any PT is working. It's tough to facility wise. Um, but I think that if the athlete again comes to you and says like, hey, I feel great, but if I have to take on a attacker 1v1 and make a tackle, that's something that I'm scared of. Then that's something that needs to be addressed. So whether that's you doing that with them in clinic or saying, hey, go try this workout progression where you're with a teammate and you're slowly building back to that. Um, that's something that is that I would say is necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, re I really like that. And um, I did want to point out that I, I have heard of a lot of like young female athletes, they'll come back from an ACL injury, and they weren't necessarily seeing a PT who was soccer specific or who understood the demands of the game so they they had built a lot of strength back but that that movement and that uh, agility or like breaking down deceleration wasn't a part of the return to play protocol so how how important is it uh for like soccer players to find a pt that is more specific uh to the game or does it matter I, I think it matters towards the end stage rehab where I, I don't think you need just a PT. You need some sort of movement professional that mm -hmm. can really break that down for you, whether that's a PT or strength coach, that's entirely up to you and what's, what's kind of around you. Um, but it is very important because where things tend to hit the fan a little bit is where we have these big jumps from one kind of base to another, whether that be from going from, strength to power or power to agility or agility back to the field those spots in between is where we tend to see some hiccups um, so having a movement professional that's that's very adept in both strength and fitness and speed and the game of soccer um, i think that's something that is very very valuable because that eases that gap in between because you you get both sides equally mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, us uh, strength coaches love working with you guys, <laughs> and we we always appreciate the the collaboration and just uh, knowing like what what your scope is. And I I have like seen a lot of PTs who are like they're CSCS certified, and they can they can break down like the change of direction and agility like really well, or they can write a periodized program really well. But everyone's like limited for time, and I think that's why we refer out to each other and we're just there to just like really serve the athlete. I mean, it takes an army as you know, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's something that people need to be aware of in terms of return to play. It's not like you're just going from like the table in the clinic right back onto the field. It's you're going to have to work a lot harder than your teammates who are healthy. <laughs> have you have you seen uh, players come in who are like two weeks post surgery, or do they come in sooner to work out and get going in their rehab? Yeah, it, it depends a lot on the surgeon if they're doing post operatively. Um, some surgeons say, "Hey, I want you in starting day one, two, three. Um, oh. Some surgeons say, "Like, let's give it four or five weeks." Um, but it's all about partnerships, right? The surgeon's also part of the army too, like you said. Um, and if you notice that, Hey, if they come in for rehab sooner, then they'll get better sooner. They go back to the field more effectively. Then it's about having that relationship with the surgeon say, Hey, instead of two, three weeks, can we maybe try one week post-op and having that communication and having that background with them before you even get an athlete from them is very, very important because just like me and you are working together, we're also working with the surgeon and the team coach that's involved too. So having that relationship is crucial. That's a good point. And it, it is important to remind everyone, this is going to be really unique. And I, I think it was, uh, was it Zlatan? He like had like a very fast uh, rehab from his ACL and everyone was like, oh my gosh, like every ACL is that fast. And it's like, no, like that's Zlatan, like not <laughs> you. <laughs> um, so <laughs> how, how important is to just like stay focused on, on your own rehab, stay in your own lane, not look at everyone else's journey. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So important. So the biggest thing, if you guys can take one takeaway from this is have a plan. Whenever you're going through rehab or return to sport or anything in life, really, you have to have a plan. And that's not to say that you can't deviate from it at times, but 
don't abandon it recklessly um, and stay true to it. And yeah, not, not everyone's as Latani Ibrahimovic or an Adrian Peterson where they come back in four and a half months. Um, they are the anomalies. And um, one of my, my mentors, he once told me that once you have the skills of someone like Slatan or Adrian Peterson, then you can alter your plan as he did. Um, so until you're that good, don't, don't do your rehab like that. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's the same thing as performance training. Like you're not doing the same speed or conditioning plan as a professional player and you're like a teenage girl. <laughs> so it, it's critical. Just st stick with your customized plan and just focus on yourself and what, and what you need to do each day. Now I want to shift gears to hamstrings. I am, um, this, this is not my wheelhouse at all, probably because I'm not exposed to hamstring injuries as much in the female athlete game. It's more like ACLs, meniscus, ankle tweaks, but let's dive into it because it is important. And I think a lot of people are under the impression, even female athletes, that their hamstrings are always tight. <laughs> is this true? <laughs> the if they're tight then they are likely weak and i'm not saying they're tight and i think what the athlete says is very very important and if they're telling you something that means they trust you and they think you can do something about it um so just even hearing that i think that's that's something that is that is good on you because now you have the ability to affect that um but in most muscle groups hamstrings included if somebody says they are tight and there is no physiological reason for that to be happening. And when I say that, I mean, some people have tight hamstrings or hip flexors because they are wheelchair bound and they, they literally are in that position for multiple hours a day. Um, most cases, the athlete's just weak. And if you improve their strength, the tightness will almost magically go away. And the reason for that is now the muscles aren't constantly sore and tight because they can take on the load and kind of recover from it in a little bit better manner where they're not constantly stuck in that cycle of the tissue readapting. So if you feel like any muscle group is tight and you want to alleviate it, yes, you can do your mobility as you've probably been doing in the past. But if you kind of take some time to sit back and reflect, you'll probably see that the mobility work hasn't made too much of a difference. So try strength for just like four to six weeks and then reassess and say, hey, was that the solution to the problem? The answer will most likely be yes. Okay. Now, what role do the, the hip flexors and glutes play into this, like, quote unquote, hamstring tightness? Yeah, so hip flexors and glutes, the glutes are definitely involved a good amount because they're all a part of like the posterior chain. So you have your glutes, your hammies, your calves, uh, even the low back to an extent, um, all very, very important. And as a, as a strength professional, if you're strengthening the hamstrings, unless you're doing an isolation exercise, you're most likely doing the glutes as well. Um, so those two kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, the hip flexors are also important because it's all a part of the pelvis. And if you can strengthen all of the musculature around the pelvis, it puts it in a better position to start off with. And then from there, um, you're more likely to just be more successful and athletic moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really love that. And um, yeah, it's just people are looking at the, the symptoms. So it's like, oh, well, my hamstring feels off, but they're not looking at every other muscle group around it that could be the cause of them feeling that way. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you explained that so, so simply. Are there any exercises that you soccer players should be doing to help with um, just strengthening the muscles around the pelvis and just helping with with their hamstrings? Yeah, all of the basic boring ones that most players often sometimes skip. Um, even if you're at home, bridges, single leg bridges, those are great for the glutes. Um, some hamstring straight leg bridges, those are great as well. If you're a little bit more advanced, um, you can definitely do some Nordics uh, either at home or with a partner with a certain setup. Um, one that I've been using a lot for both youth athletes and adults actually is um, a hip flexor hold um, for hip flexor capacity where you almost go up to the wall and you pick up your one knee as if you're just doing like a high knee hold mm -hmm. and you just hold it there until, until you feel that burn and you repeat that several times a week. And 
Um, actually, this past year, I, I had a hip injury where for whatever reason, my hip flexor was not, ups- not going well with me. I guess COVID kind of got to it a little bit. But um, yeah, I did that for, it was bothering me for months. Um, and I did some strength for four to six weeks and it got better. Um, so yeah, it's one of my favorites. So you guys, this stuff works. We're not just, <laughs> we're not just trying to sell something. Like we, we see, we've seen it work on many athletes and ourselves and, and all the research is there. So committing to, I would say at minimum six weeks of a strength and conditioning plan just to, to see the physiological results, but sticking with it year round <laughs> because yeah. then you're just going to wither away and then you're back to where you started, especially if you're a growing female athlete, it's important that you keep all of your muscles strong. And, and now I do want to touch on growing pains just because I have you here. And I know a lot of people are like curious how to navigate things like, uh, Osgood slaughter and patellar pain. So what's, what's exactly like going on when a young girl has pain in the kneecap? Uh, it depends on the cause. Um, so Osgood slaughter is very, very common. Um, so we can kind of start there. And when, when that's happening, the muscles are not keeping up with the bone in terms of lengthening. Um, it's kind of crazy to think and even looking back of how the growth process happens, like everything literally has to grow. If one thing is a little bit behind, there's going to be some sort of an issue. Um, so yeah, in this case, the muscle itself isn't becoming longer and isn't becoming stronger enough to the point where it can keep up with the length of the bone. And because of that, that fourth kind of has to go somewhere and that goes um, right to the knee with Oscar Slatter. And um, there's, you can do a good amount of treatment with it. The obvious thing to do is to wait until the growth process stops and then the pain will go away. Um, But that can be quite a long time. So in the meantime, you get stronger, you work on mobility and that will also help to decrease your pain. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that because I've seen a lot of girls, they'll go see a PT and like the pain is relieved some, but they're, they're still going through that growth process. And it's also like, I hate to say it, it's just a matter of patience. Like wait till you're 13, 14, (laughs) some go a little bit longer, but um, I'm, I'm really glad you were super transparent about that. But yes, working on just your, your mobility and strengthening, is, is there um, something going on with like the quad muscle too, or like stretches to do for that? Does that play a role? Yeah, yeah. And that kind of goes back to the tightness thing we talked about earlier is oftentimes they'll have or they'll have what is perceived as tight quads and hip flexors. If you work on the strength from that, then not only will they get stronger and longer, but they'll be able to recover quicker. Um, And because of that, that leads to some decreased pain in the knee. Um, So definitely whatever quad mobility work you want to do, especially like before matches and games and even rope it into like a daily mobility program. um, I think that's something that could be very, very helpful. I I love that. And I've seen like, um, what's the stretch called? It's like the wall stretch is, do you do that? Like the hip flexor wall stretch, is that a good one for quad or relieving some of the knee pain or do you have the others you want to share? Um, if you guys want to take a minute to kind of go through this one with me, I'll try to talk you through it right now. So Perfect. if you can, um, what you guys are going to do is find a comfy place on the ground to kind of lie down. And I want you to lie down on your right side for me, um, almost like you're sleeping on your right side. And what I want you to do with your left hand is grab your left ankle and pull your left ankle towards your butt. Now, you might feel a little bit of a stretch with that. Okay, so this is a a multi-step stretch that I like to do with some people. And the stretch gets more and more progressive as you go through the steps. So um, what we're stretching right now is more of the quad. Now, to increase the intensity of the stretch, if you guys right now, again, you have your left hand grabbing your left ankle, pulling that left ankle towards your butt. What you can then do is take your right foot your right heel to be more precise and put it on top of your left knee. From there, you're gonna push with your foot, pushing that quad back more, you'll feel even more of a stretch. 
Now you're going to activate the quads and the hip flexors with that one. All right. So this is step two. Step three, what you're going to do is that left shoulder that's probably high up in the air right now. You're going to drop that left shoulder back onto the ground. And from there, you're going to stretch the quads, the hip flexors, and a little bit of the abs as well. Um, so that's probably my favorite go-to stretch for um, anybody with any sort of hip or quad tightness. Um, take it step by step and then progress as needed. I'm so glad you explained that. And that, that was perfect. I got, I got like a great visual of, of what we all need to do. Um, so guys, like I hope you, you start executing that if you have any knee pain. And like Andy said, like you can incorporate it before a game or just you can do it daily just to re relieve some of the pain. Now, uh, foam rolling. I have to ask you because <laughs> I we've had our conversations on foam rolling. What what is your opinion? So, like, would it would it benefit someone to like foam roll their quad to relieve the knee, or is it more just mental at that point? Like, I know the research is so conflicting, but what what's your opinion? <laughs> yeah, um, it is. <sighs> okay, so we'll start. <laughs> we'll start here with the foam rolling. Um, this, I mean, these are my thoughts that I interpreted from the research that I've read. Um, it, it's no magic tool. Um, what we're essentially doing is we're not even, and this is according to the research that I've read, we're really not making much changes in the muscle when we're doing foam rolling. And that's the main goal that we're, we're trying to do at that point, right, is we're going to foam roll to decrease muscle tension. And that's mobility and will perform better on the field. What we're really doing when we're foam rolling is affecting the nervous system and just kind of decreasing the, the tension between the nerves and the muscles around it and allowing everything to just relax a little bit. Um, now, the problem with that is those changes aren't really sustainable. Um, they could be gone potentially within minutes after you're done foam rolling. It's like you've never really done it. Um, and that's where I really, really struggle with it as an intervention because athletes are already strapped for time, right? They, they already have a lot to do, especially if you're a student athlete, like every second, every minute of the day is so valuable to, for you to use. And my thoughts on it are, okay, if you have all the time in the world and you have extra time before training or after training and you want to do it, that's totally cool. But it shouldn't be a priority for you if you're strapped for time, which most people tend to be. Okay, that's that's really great. I'm, <laughs> I know it, it's a topic that that you're passionate about, and it it really it isn't a magic tool. And I think it's it's great to be just be honest about that and be realistic. But would you say if like it makes people feel better, they just like still do it? It's not really gonna harm anything. Is that true? Yeah, I, I don't think it's harmful at all whatsoever. And if you're someone that you're out there and you say, okay, Andy just said that, but I disagree because it helps me every week, then keep doing it because it works for you. And that's the whole goal. That's what's the most important. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's harmful as long as it's not, as long as it's not an athlete foam rolling for four hours a night and sleeping for four, then keep on doing it, you know, because- yeah. Uh, it's something that it could help some people. It's just not my intervention of choice. Now I'm having flashbacks to when you came to Baltimore, <laughs> when uh, you came to the facility and then we went and got Mexican food afterwards and we were having this discussion and we were talking about recovery and just mu muscle soreness and the nervous system and the perception of soreness. And, and you said the best recovery is um, it's going to be your sleep and your nutrition, not yes. like ice, not, you know, getting your back rubbed, like none, <laughs> none of that. So if it, do you just want to just gloss over why sleep and nutrition are so key for recovery and alleviating muscle soreness? Yeah. It's all about when is the body actually getting better? Um, when are you actually getting stronger and faster and, and more agile? It's when you're sleeping, because when you're on the field, when you're on the pitch, you're pu putting your body through stress, 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 it's breaking down. And you're, you're like a castle, right? You got to build that castle back up. And that happens when you are sleeping. That's when your body says, okay, all of that happened during the day. I need to adapt so that tomorrow I can take that stress again. 
And if you don't adapt, then you're constantly breaking down again. And that's where a lot of these stretch injuries tend to happen is when you don't give the body enough time to recover. Um, so yeah, that, that time sleeping is very important. And whenever, whatever you're eating, that's the raw materials that you're using to build this castle of yours, right? If you don't have the, the requisite protein and carbs in your body, there is no possible way your muscle can get stronger. It's like trying to build a castle without any stone, right? You need that there. Otherwise, you just can't get stronger and faster. So I love that you use the the castle analogy because this is the Soccer Queens podcast. So well done. With oh, yes, that is true. Oh, my <laughs> so, God. <laughs> so good. And Oops. yeah, too perfect. Uh, by the way, I'm going to use uh, your piece of advice with the crown jewel and like give like a, a takeaway for, for like every episode or maybe solo episodes. So again, thank you for contributing to the podcast <laughs> and the, the Queens theme. <laughs> um, so great. Now I do want to talk about any, are there any other injuries you want to touch on that you see happening in mainly youth soccer players, whether it's overuse or, um, certain like knee or ankle or concussions, anything that you see a lot of and what we need to do about it? Um, I think concussions are starting to finally go in the right direction. Um, just the awareness and I we could probably thank the the NFL and everything regarding <laughs> everything going on there for that um, people are much more in tune and um, the concept of oh he just got he or she got their bell wrong is kind of going to bed which is great um, I think the next hurdle we have is the travel demands and the overall just fitness demands of youth sport it's going through the roof especially in america where it's very common to see teenagers and and youth players literally traveling across the country every weekend to compete which um i i don't think is necessary in most cases and even if you look at europe right where in, in soccer that's like the crown jewel england is like the size of like the northeast and the most they're traveling is three to four hours per weekend. But um, here we are like flying from New York to California on the regular to play for 90 minutes uh, at a team's level, which we could probably found like in our, in our local neighborhoods. So um, I think that's the next thing is, is managing load and at the youth level, because it's getting to the point where it's probably necessary. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's getting a, a lot worse and, and you see a lot of kids have more jam packed schedules than the pros sometimes. And, you know, Andy, I've seen it too many times uh, in just coaching in the last several years, there's been a lot of injuries that could have been highly prevented with load monitoring and like just avoiding this crazy schedule of like three to four practices a week and then playing a game on like a Saturday and then another full game on a Sunday. It, it's just, it's crazy. And then at that point it's like, shoot, like sometimes it doesn't really matter how strong the athlete is at that point because their nervous system is just totally shot. <laughs> uh, yeah. They're just overstressed, overstimulated. Like you said, their, their sleep might get disrupted or maybe they're just on the go so much that they're not nourishing well enough. And it is something as we move into the future uh, to consider, um, but hopefully it's something that that changes within, within the youth system, especially after COVID. I mean, a lot of kids got the break that they needed. <laughs> like everyone, like when, when March last year hit, everyone was like, oh my gosh, like a break for once. And all these parents were like, yay. <laughs> so yep. it, it was a silver lining to it. And like, no one really lost their fitness in those three months. Like, I mean, if you just plopped on the sofa the whole time, but overall like it was a much needed rest from like the tournaments and the travel like it was awesome <laughs> yeah and I, I think because recreationally growing up I, I played at a lower level at most I played once a week right once a week plus maybe two training sessions and it wasn't really until I started volunteering with like higher level clubs where I was like oh these tournaments they're, they're actually full games and you have multiple in one day and you do that like three days, like how does that, and it doesn't work, it, it just doesn't. And that's how you get some of these injuries where it's like, yeah, no wonder why on game five of six in three days, you had two ACL tears because you had like five games in like three days. 
and you really wanted to win. So you played your most important players every minute of every game. And of course they said yes, because they want to do the same. Um, that's, that's just something that, that isn't sustainable for anybody. And yeah, they are full games. Like they're like 75, 80 minute games. And then it's like, okay, well, we're going to go again the next day. Still 75, 80 minutes. <laughs> And it's crazy because in the, um, like the U S soccer, like, um, like C license course in the periodization, uh, section that we did, it was like, okay, it takes about like 72 hours post game to fully recover. So keep this in mind. And all of us are sitting there like, wait, but the system is basically setting us all up to fail as coaches. (laughs) Like what, why is this in the license course? (laughs) You know, like, it's just, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what, what the way forward is. What, what are you seeing uh, at or I mean, actually, no, you start with Orlando next week. Have you worked with, like, any other – you worked with uh, – what's his name? Uh, Mike Young. Did you have any conversations with him about this? Or, like, is this going to be something that improves? Like, <laughs> Yeah, so um, I talked a little bit with the athletic trainer of North Carolina FC Youth um, when I was volunteering with them a little bit because – um, he was the athletic trainer who had to deal with all the people who did all that and then got injured as a result. And at some point it comes back to the goals of the club and the structure that is embedded or systems that are embedded below it. Because if you're in that scenario, you as a coach shouldn't be pressured to play that star player every single match because you should already have protocols in place that say, okay, if we have a three game tournament, and we have three days in a row where we have to perform, well, minutes restriction for everybody, regardless of how good they are or whatnot, um, that needs to be in place because it's for the overall safe health and well-being of the players. Um, you almost have to look at it as a system at that point and say, this happens on a regular basis. That means the structure is letting that happen, which means we have to change that structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's also a good insight there. I know a lot of youth coaches who do a good job of managing like the minutes played and just letting certain players sit out if they had played the full game the day before. And like a lot of these like higher level teams like ECNL, like it's it's more about like, okay, getting seen by colleges. So if like one girl had a bunch of colleges show up to watch her then okay maybe the next day when those colleges aren't there like she can just chill and let's showcase the other players so they're fresh so I some coaches do do a good job but um it it must be just like getting getting the education out there and making sure coaches understand the recovery window for a lot of these players and a lot of them are growing teenage athletes <laughs> so all the more reason to treat them with great care and to load monitor it's just otherwise we're doing them a, a complete disservice now is there anything else you want to touch on as far as injuries uh con- concussions uh what what can we do to prevent those um is it only just isolating the neck or should we be training the whole body like what what is it yeah so It's one of those weird ones. So um, I actually did my my senior thesis in undergrad on concussions, specifically in soccer. And it's very interesting because whenever we have a concussion, it's it's, the name itself needs to be rebranded. And we're currently in the process of it, of labeling it as a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and that's the care and the, the seriousness in which it needs to be taken care of because it, it's brain damage. And again, youth soccer players, they need that care. They need to be treated with an abundance of caution. Um, in terms of prevention, where we're seeing some of the rules in certain states being changed to eliminate heading and, and head-to-head contact, most concussions don't actually happen ball to head. They happen head to another head or head to ground or the goalpost. And with some of these rules being changed, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding that the ball inherently, in in regards to strictly concussions, um, the ball inherently really isn't that dangerous. It's the players around you. And it's the overall just spatial awareness of, do I know what's in my surroundings? Do I know that there's a teammate behind me or an opponent behind me? Or do I even know there's a goalpost like right next to me? A lot of the times, especially with youth players, they're not aware of their surroundings. So in terms of coaching, I think that's a big thing that we can improve 
even just the, the simple cue of always check your shoulder and communicate with your teammates saying like, hey, man on behind you. That's something that I think could really take a big role in this. Mm-hmm. That's so good because most people are under the impression it's like, oh, well, we got to do more strengthening of the neck muscles or the back. And I get that a lot from parents too, but that ability to scan the field and have that awareness of your body and space is a huge piece of it. And it sounds like that's like the main cause of, of all this. And that's interesting that you said with it's rarely head to the ball. Um, so the whole like getting rid of the, the heading is not, not really helping. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not really helping in terms of um, decreasing the incidence of head to ball. Um, but if you remove heading altogether, then you're not really going to get the head to head contact because mm-hmm. where else are you going to get that? Um, so yeah, it, it, will it decrease the incidence? Yeah. Um, But I think just being aware is much more important. Um, And this is why the NFL with their new helmets, one of the big things they're doing is increasing the size of the visual field in the helmets. Because yes, head and neck strength, that's very important. And if you can brace your neck properly before you get hit, will it decrease your risk? Potentially, yes. But if you can't see that coming, you won't have time to. Um, so that's why, especially in the NFL now, they're increasing the visual field so you can see more peripherally and you can be more aware of your surroundings. Um, so yeah, it's also important. Thank you, NFL. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, helping the soccer, the soccer world, the, the real football though. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to just, uh, close out with, uh, just a, a different, a different topic here because on, uh, the soccer Queens podcast, we talk a lot about just developing the total human and just being great people. And I want to just commend Andy for uh, a text that he had sent me I think it was back in January Um, I so I had written an article and everyone who's listened to this podcast or has read my blog or has seen my Facebook I just I go off on my opinion on COVID and we're not going to get into it I'm I want to more so uh, recognize Andy for what he had said to me because he had, uh, you know, disagreed, uh, like most humans disagree on topics <laughs> with uh, what I had said in my article. But um, a lot of the people who disagreed with me, I got like some like really bad hate mail, like people were like really hurtful. And it, it was uh, just a, a big surprise and just a pleasant surprise when Andy had reached out and he said, hey, like, that took a lot of guts to write that, like, you know, we will agree to disagree on this. Like I can see your points, but like, that's great that you, uh, you know, had the courage to write that and like, well done. And I was like, dude, like, you're awesome. Like, (laughs) it's like, just like disagreeing is like, it's, it's that simple. Like you can always like still, you, you can still be cordial with people and be friends and respect them. And I want to make that clear, uh, especially with like young athletes, if you're listening and I've heard a lot of these conversations in my sessions, I've heard the drama going on in school. I've heard you fighting and disagreeing with your friends, but at the end of the day, like just have a conversation. And I think now as humans, we've forgotten how to have a conversation as individuals. And it's okay to show up and be an individual and to think your own way or to disagree on certain topics or to agree on other big topics. Like that's, that's okay. Like we're not all going to think the same. So Andy, you rock. Thank you. Do you have anything to say? (laughs) Yeah, it's, um, I, I actually love opposing viewpoints. Um, my favorite show on television is actually First Take um, with Stephen A. Smith. And it's a debate show on ESPN where they, they talk sports and they, they literally argue for two hours. Um, and I, I love it because at the end of the day, you can always learn from each other. And at the end of the day, like also different people are on earth for, for different reasons. And they're here to serve different people of different audiences. Um, and you may connect with some people more than others, which is very much okay. Um, but I, I think it's very important to be respectful of everybody and at least try to hear what they're saying and somewhat put yourself in their shoes. And 
also just be a nice person too. Like I've seen the internet, like it's, it's a dark place, man, especially Twitter. Oh my God. Oh, Twitter's Twitter is, like the wild west. Like, <laughs> yeah, it, it is absurd. Some of the things like just, there's just no decorum or, or understanding or anything. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think one important thing for everybody to take home, especially like everybody's on the internet these days is you never really know what someone's going through and putting someone on blast publicly without really knowing their full background or story is most likely never a good solution. Um, and I think that's very important for everybody to know and, and comprehend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. And it's, it's more about than just, you know, seeing what someone posts or, you know, like reading a headline. There's always like so much more to the story. And it's always a good thing to ask questions or to, you know, reach out to someone and be like, hey, like, what, what was that about? Like, can you explain your, your thought process there? And it's, again, it, it's good to just like accept people for, you know, being individuals and just bringing different thought processes to the table. And I love that you said you, you watch the show where people disagree and debate. That's really, really healthy. And, you know, if we want to go more down the rabbit hole, it's like, okay, if you look at a soccer team, yeah, there's the collective group, but what makes that collective group awesome? It's everyone showing up as themselves and everyone's not thinking the same way. We're not doing the same actions on the field. If you're forward, you're finishing. If you're a defender, you, you're the aggressive one. If you're the center mid, you're bringing your creativity. And that's what makes sports rich and exciting and the same goes for life and and your relationships and i think that's it's important to remember that for everything uh that we are involved in <laughs> yeah and it, there's a lot that goes into i think actually like understanding an argument um and I mean, I guess, I guess it really comes back to the whole total human point is this is something that you learn in like English class, right? Of really learning how to say, okay, you think this way, I think that way. Let's disagree on that. But I actually like points A and B, what you said. I'm going to incorporate that into my program. And because of that, I will be better at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And if you've never had that kind of exchange or dialogue in a respectful manner, that exchange would never happen. And at the end of the day, you're the one that just lost because you lost an opportunity to improve and get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or to just see a, a new fresh perspective. Um, and, th and that's really how you grow. Like if people trigger you, that's something to explore. That, that might be a, a good thing. And it actually reminds me, so I, I'm a big fan of Russell Brand and um, he would be considered, you know, like super liberal, but he had Candace Owens on his show and like, it was like a two hour, like they were like shouting, but it was like hilarious. And um, there was like a point where Russell's like, dang, like stop shouting at me. Like, <laughs> also you're really pretty. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> like, it was just funny. But then like they both like, at one point, uh, Russell was like, wow, like you changed my mind on that. And then at another point, Candace was like, wow, you changed my mind on your view. And I'm like, wow, like, that's awesome. Two people who are so different. We're like, wow, you might've changed my mind on that. And that's, that, that's awesome. And that's, that's where the good stuff happens. But anyway, I just thought that was like really funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually want to talk to you about your, I think it was a recent tweet of yours about research. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Let, let's talk about that a little bit because I mean, we both have experience in kind of the research realm a little bit. You probably and, know more than I do, though, uh, but I can try. <laughs> so it's, it's funny because I remember being younger, not just younger, um, yeah, I, I guess you could say younger, and just watching the news of, oh, this study says this. Because of that, we should do this. And because I was, I was younger, I was like, hmm, study, news, like those two things, they're both pretty reputable. And mm -hmm. I, I, I automatically assume that to be entirely true. Um, but the research world, man, that's another dark place. And yeah, oh my goodness, it is. <laughs> um, and one of the things that's very important, and you kind of mentioned it in your tweet, is whenever you see research, go back and say, okay, let me go find that original paper. Who wrote it? Is anybody paying them to write that? Do they have their own agenda? 
and yeah. did that potentially impact whatever they wrote? And did the media properly interpret their article and not kind of expunge in a way that it, it makes it go to another level? Totally, totally. And it, and it goes for, for all sides, like, you know, like holistic or allopathic or PT, strength and conditioning, re, like everything, like every field, like we're calling you out and like, we're not going to look at a research study and, and take everything that's suggested without digging deeper into those things. And the, the one you mentioned, Andy, about like who uh, peer reviewed it, was it like their boys, you know, <laughs> who are also like biased as much as the, the main author or who, who funded it? Do they have an agenda? And I think it just comes back to just asking questions. Like it's never a bad thing to ask questions, but then also like try it on yourself. You know, like your, your ongoing research study is what you're doing too. Um, and I always say this with, with my athletes, like in our sessions, like that's, that's our research study. Like we, we've been doing this for nine years and you know, if something feel feels off or something's not right over time, then, okay, we're going to tweak it a little bit. Okay. So we don't cause too much damage, but we're just going to tweak and then we'll research something else. Um, so that's, I don't know. I'm really, I'm really mixed about research. I think practice is so important. Asking questions, uh, talking to other humans who have been practicing for a while as well, because that's just as much research as what's done in a lab, I'd say. Yeah. And I, I think where the research world is getting darker is there's actually these things called predatory journals where, there are journals out there, their main goal is not to pump out quality research. It's in fact the exact opposite, which is to make as much money as possible. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> so um, I'll give you a quick story. One of my professors um, in PT school, Dr. Chad Cook, um, he's one of the highly most regarded researchers in all of physical therapy. And he gets requests from these predatory journals all the time. He could literally write a, a pile of, of nothingness, send it to a journal, published right away. And he actually tested this one time where he wrote a paper regarding um, spinal manipulation, which is cracking backs on people who were dead and the effectiveness of it. And as you all know, if someone's dead, it's not going to affect them. Well, in his paper, and even in the abstract, <clears throat> he noted, and this is a completely fake study, that he did spinal manipulation on dead people. It relieved their pain and it brought them back to life. And that is a paper that is published in a journal. And a news, art, a news um, outlet could easily take that and say, oh, that's a paper that was published, so therefore it must be fact. And then boom, it ends up on the news. But in reality, you also have to look at what journal did I take this from and what's their reputation. And that's something that is very, very hard for someone to do. Like, I, I can't do that. And I'm kind of like a research nerd. And it's at, at some point, it, it comes back to what you said of, okay, you are your own research study and do what works for you. So those are called predator, predatory journals? Predatory journals, yes. They are looking for people to submit to them. And of course, when you submit to them, you have to pay. And that's the goal. Okay, guys, so if any of these people reach out to you, <laughs> just ignore their call. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, yeah, it's so interesting because I think like a lot of people now just put all research on a pedestal. They're like, oh, well, that's a study. We're going to just follow that. But it's like, then you have like these journals that just are so like, they just don't have a good reputation. And it's like, well, we need to dive into that as well and ask why. Um, and should we put them on a pedestal? Should we follow these people? Um, uh, granted, there's great research out there. Um, I've used a lot of research for, for change of direction mechanics, um, kinematics of uh, deceleration for female athletes. There's a lot of great research on certain topics and things that I'm executing and, and Andy as well in the clinic but just know that not all research is good. <laughs> yep. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> it, it's a crazy, even darker place than Twitter, I think, the, the research world. <laughs> and I'm sure you see a lot of it in physical therapy. Um, 
is that is that true like you're you're just like so much more exposed to it than probably i am yeah if you go in some of these uh physical therapy groups it's it's just arguments of i think this and this this and this paper all back at my point and the other person replies well i think the opposite because of these three papers and it goes back and forth like paper 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 and you will always find evidence whatever your your thoughts are in life in general yeah. you will always find evidence to back that up everything um but again it's about embracing the other side and saying okay i have a b and c but maybe d is helpful and you have that so i'm just gonna you know take a little bit of that and because of that i'll be better mm -hmm. yeah that's so true any like opinion you have like you know you and i have differing opinions we could like slap several research studies supporting our opinion like they're all they're all out there so it's like well what is the truth well the truth is i think it's your truth but the truth is you asking questions and it i don't think you ever really find a truth but you can pursue it by like deeply deeply asking questions and i'll it's so funny because i'll get on twitter twitter is such a dark place and i'll i'll post like my like change of direction videos with my girls and there will be those people that ask, hey, like, do you have a study to support that that works? <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my God. And those are the comments. I'm just like, I'm not even going to respond because I just, I just study movement with the coach's eye. And I ask my athletes how they feel naturally uh, within the way their nervous system's working. And if they feel behind in a step or uncomfortable or unbalanced, like I don't, there are studies, but I'm not going to like share a study and be like, that's what I used. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, it comes back to not taking a, a glimpse of somebody's one exercise, a 15 second video of it and judging the entire coach off of it. Right. Because is there a research study for every exercise that everybody does? No, but are you doing it in a planned manner? Right. Are you doing your proper progressions and regressions as needed? And is that over a, a four to six, eight week span where you actually have the tissue adapting? Of course. And that's all scientifically backed. So just because a small snippet isn't, that doesn't mean that that's representative of the entire program. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Now, I, I think, gosh, so many, there, there's so many good things coming from this episode and I feel like we should do a part two, Andy, and like just I don't know, we can dive into whatever you want to dive into next time. I know you had mentioned like GPS and all these other great topics, but um, before we go, I do want to ask, what is one piece of advice you would give youth athletes to continue to be their healthiest selves? Yeah, if you want to be healthy, you have to have a plan to be healthy. And um, you have to map out, you, at least the bare minimum is mapping out what you're doing every week of having strength training on certain days, skills training on others, game days on others, recovery for others, that needs to be mapped out and planned. And if you can do that, you can make that plan bigger and more extensive as you go on. Um, but have that plan, have that base to work off of because there are days where you're gonna feel lost and a little bit confused and having that security blanket will do wonders for you. Um, that's priority number one for not only strength and conditioning and soccer, but uh, just life in general. Awesome. Now I do want everyone to follow up with you. I know you're super active on Instagram, not as much Twitter, <laughs> which I understand. So wh where can they connect with you on Instagram? Yeah, on IG, you can find me at the football physios, football with a U. Um, and yeah, if you ever want to DM me, they're always open as long as you're kind. Be nice, be kind, right? That's your slogan. Yeah. So do that and I'll probably answer. Yeah, and Andy has a, a really great page. There's tons of exercise explanations for, for rehab and performance for soccer players. It's just really, really valuable. So make sure you, you follow up with them. Andy, this was awesome. I feel like it felt like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a quick hour, but I hope you guys- It was a very are... quick hour, yeah. Yeah, you, you definitely Thank you again. Everything. This was super, and everyone's going to just get so many nuggets from, from what you had to say. Yeah.